Well, this is an attempt to be practical, uh, which is not my usual thing. Um, but I'll start with some poetry. Uh, it's my favorite uh, few lines on the doctor you need at the end of your life. It's W.H. Auden contemplating his own death. And he writes, give me a doctor partridge plump, short in the leg and broad in the rump. An endomorph with gentle hands who will not make absurd demands that I abandon all my vices, but with a twinkle in his eye will tell me that I have to die. This is so far from what we teach in medical school now as to be laughable. Uh, there's not a teachable moment in the whole poem. Uh, and frankly, that's healthcare, not medicine. Uh, and it's peculiarly ineffective. Uh, that, I used that poem in an article that appeared in the Canadian Medical Association Journal a few years ago. Uh, a couple of feminists wrote a piece about how medicine should be changed to suit their image. And uh, I was cross enough to sit down and write an essay. Uh, it happened that the Canadian Medical Association Journal's office was on my way home. So I popped it through the door with a little note saying, I wrote this to feel better. I don't suppose you'll publish it, but it did its job for me. And to my astonishment, I got a call the next morning from the editor who said, I will publish it with one proviso. You must allow me to solicit two uh, rebuttals of your position. I said, sure, go ahead. And so two feminists wrote uh, that I was a dead white male, basically. Uh, the interesting thing was the correspondence I had afterwards, not in the columns, but from across the country. People wrote me emails and letters saying, ah, I'm not bothering writing to the journal, they won't publish my letter, but you're right. Uh, the world has changed, and the change towards health from medicine uh, has not been thought about at all. Historically, you see, it wasn't until the 1860s, as I've said several times in this conference, that it was better for you to go to the doctor than not go to the doctor in terms of whether you were alive in a little while. Going to the doctor didn't have a better mortality outcome until around 1863, 66, in that period. Uh, before that, however, doctors were still respected. And of course, the interesting thing in my lifetime is that when I started in medicine uh, in the 1950s, um, we had only a fraction of the therapeutic and surgical punch we carry now. But we were respected. Uh, it was an honorable activity, and the patients were very nice. Uh, in part, of course, this was the NHS, and this, for Ameri this next bit is going to be a little upsetting for some of you. But I have to say that, in all honesty, the most satisfying medicine I did in my life was done under the NHS, the National Health Service in Britain, in the very early days. Um, it, wasn't, it didn't come in until the late 40s, and people were still getting over it or getting used to it by the time I was a young doctor. And coming from a blue-collar background, uh, I, I remembered people who wouldn't go to the doctors because they couldn't afford it, and that disappeared. So they were pleased to have no anxiety about being driven into bankruptcy by healthcare costs. And consequently, they didn't abuse the system. I doubt whether any of you have ever had a patient say to you when you got up at night, I'm sorry for getting you out of bed, doctor. Have you ever had that said? No, because now they have a sense of entitlement. They've paid for it, it's your service. But I heard that many times in those days. Um, we were paid very little. Uh, my first check for 400 hours work was 70 bucks. Well, that was 1950, whatever it was. Uh, that's uh, not very much. But we did live in the hospital. and every, We had no costs. Uh, food, water. Uh, even you could leave your shoes outside your room and they were polished in the morning when you woke up. Little things like that. And... A cup of tea was brought in to wake you up in the morning at whatever hour you chose, you know. Uh, different in that sense. Uh, the best source of income for me was ash cash. Uh, that came from cremation certificates, which you had to fill in an extra form. It was worth one guinea. Um, 
I, I was cynical enough at that stage. This was the 50s when smog in London was something to behold. But you couldn't see the second row from here uh, when the fog was really bad. Uh, buses had to have someone walk in front of them if the smog came down really thick. Uh, so the, the things they do in the Sherlock Holmes movies about London in the Victorian periods was true in London in 1950s until they cleaned up. It's the sulphur, by the way, that matters. Um, but that meant respiratory disease was the big deal in winter and death was the normal outcome. And since Ashcash was so profitable, uh, when the emergency bed service was trying to find a bed and I was on call and they asked me whether I'd got a bed, I said, what's the religion of the patient? And if they were Jews or Catholics, I didn't take them. Uh, nothing against Jews or Catholics, but they don't burn. So no ash cash. <laughs> and that was actually my major source of income. The world has changed, hasn't it? That's the point I'm making, really. It's changed dramatically. Uh, there were a few antibiotics. Uh, the treatment of hypertension, you had to choose uh, between having your blood pressure controlled and you being unable to stand up uh, or have sex or not controlling it and do what you wanted to do. So they sort of compromised. It still helped a bit. We had no dialysis. Uh, no open heart surgery had been done. Uh, and yet it was a much more appreciative doctor-patient relationship. So the problem is that in my lifetime, medicine has gone from being therapeutically ineffective to incredible. And in the same period, as uh, standing in the public high has been from the top, well down the list, getting close to politicians at this stage. Why? Well, I think we can work out some of the reasons. Why was medicine so important in the past and not now? Prognosis was the most important thing that we gave. And the fact that our understanding that death was coming mattered. Uh, and also, of course, relationship. Uh, pe people stayed in hospital for at least a week in, in the 50s. Uh, almost whatever it was, it, it's what happened. I even had a boss who would occasionally send in a, an old man who was living alone. It, the, it would simply say TLC on it. Tender loving care. It meant he's coming in for a week and make sure he gets a bottle of Guinness every night. And you could prescribe it. It was OK. I mean, I'm, I'm painting a picture of a world that's almost beyond belief to you. Um, the London hospitals looked after their doctors in particular ways, particularly the Brompton Hospital, which was a chest hospital in London, the, the, the chest institute. And it still was keeping a lovely uh, throwback to the past. Sally remembers this because that's when we were engaged and she would come to dinner at the Brompton uh, because it wasn't a cafeteria. Because way back when tuberculosis was killing people everywhere, the only thing you could do to protect your young doctors was to give them good food. Um, so we had first class chefs jugged hair for dinner and things like that, you know. The food was fabulous. <laughs> And dinner literally started at seven minutes past seven, and there were ve you had to be very sick for the doctor to see you at seven minutes past seven. Uh, and of course, we got very good chefs because people who'd worked in the major restaurants in London, they were working to one in the morning. But Brompton offered them a nice job with a reasonable income, and they prepared one superb meal a day. They loved it as a retirement uh, job. Uh, the, the, the fact that it was like that produced an entirely different atmosphere, which is what Auden is talking about there. A doctor who related to the patient as a person without thinking about it. It wasn't something that you tried to teach, because you can't actually teach it, can you? Good manners were acquired from your parents, or should be. And that's what they were responding to. They'd even make fun of you in a lovely way. I mean, when I was a young doctor, I was... 23, when I started medicine, I looked as though I was 18. And I chose to work in the, uh, the South London branch of the St. George's because the medicine was much more interesting amongst the working class than amongst the, the knobs. I mean, the, 
The major problem at St George's Hyde Park Corner was Debs who didn't have a date at the weekend and attempted suicide. Well, you get tired of that after a while. Um, but in, in, in the, the working class area, it was quite different. And uh, <laughs> the funniest one, these uh, ladies had decided, this is a nightingale ward with 25 beds each side. And they decided they were going to embarrass me. I, and so I, I was doing rounds. And with the working class, you didn't have to have a chaperone. There wasn't any risk of being anybody going mad in that direction. So uh, I got about halfway around, and they'd work it out. And I drew the curtain to listen to the chest of an old lady who was in heart failure. And then she, in a loud voice, said, Oh, doctor, do that again. Nobody's done that to me for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I was as red as a beach <laughs> when I came out. <laughs> but can you imagine laughter like that today? No. It was a genuine, really good joke, wasn't it? I mean, everybody in the ward felt better for an hour or two. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and somehow, I think as Christians, we might have a chance to do something about this. Uh, it starts with us looking a bit more joyful, really. Uh, there ought to be a lot more laughter around. I mean, the funniest thing God ever made was us, really. Uh, so, and I, I think he made us that way. Have you noticed, by the way, it's us that don't get a, an accolade in Genesis 2? Two things, the heavens and us. The Jews say the heavens because all the nations around them worship the heavens. The gods and goddesses lived there and procreation produced everything. Um, so they were sacred. And the Jews thought about why God hadn't said that, and then they realized, and that, that little line, he made the stars also. You know, what a throwaway line. Nobody's ever beaten that for a throwaway line. Uh, the Jews say, he's telling us that the heavens are not to be confused with him. He's bigger than the heavens. The heavens are just something he made. As Chesterton said, perhaps to God the stars are like little diamonds. Um, a lovely way to put it. So that actually, right back there, made reductive, destructive science okay. God doesn't mind if we take his world apart to find out how it works, as long as our motives are right, understanding. But for people who worship the skies, anything that approached that would be sacrilege. And a mindset that would never, ever generate science. Now us, well, God knew what we were going to do. That's really interesting, isn't it? That he, he knew that the creation he was making had intrinsically built into it the possibility, indeed the likelihood of sin. I think he said the inevitability of sin. Why? Because he wanted us to love him. It's a love story. And he was going to enter into it himself to teach us what we were really meant to be. And that's a different world altogether. So, you know, no, we don't deserve an indi individual accolade because that was to be earned in an entirely different way, as gift, as grace. But if we were perfect, we would have had no need of grace and uh, we would have been people with miniature vision compared to what we're having hints of now and what heaven will be. A very different understanding. So we have a bigger view than other people do, if we have time to stand back and, and think about it. Um, the character of the physician is not what's looked at anymore. Even in our churches, have you noticed, in 1 Timothy 3, the leadership in the church, as far as I can see, has no skills required. Isn't that interesting? It's all character. Christians want character to lead and you hire skill when it's needed. But character must choose what happens. So in the church, humble people who are illiterate, who love the Lord, are perfectly appropriate to leadership in the church. Just because you've been in banking all your life probably precludes you from leading in the church in the modern world. But you might have some skills that the church could use. Uh, we need to think that way. I gather that one of you has, like me, has learned the Sermon on the Mount by heart. Well, that was an experience that changed you, wasn't it? Uh, certainly changed me. And of course, what Jesus is doing at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount 
is talking about the Christian character, the character of the disciple. And I think our churches would, would change completely if we took the Sermon on the Mount seriously. Uh, I probably go through the Beatitudes every day at some point. And the way they work changes you. You ever thought about, you see, they're aphorisms, aren't they? Any academic looks at them and says, that's a set of aphorisms. So what, what's an aphorism for? Well, it's a short, memorable clip that you can hang your hat on, so to speak, but it needs development to, for meaning. So the question that comes up, after each of those aphorisms, undoubtedly Jesus explained them at the time. So we don't have the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible, we have the lecture notes. And your job is to fill in the blanks. So the first thing that Jesus wants of all of you is blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a pretty strange start, isn't it? You can't imagine a company today setting up, well, the first thing we want from our employees is poverty of spirit. What does he mean by that? Well, I think he means internal honesty. Practicing internal honesty. Now, if you say to God, show me what I look like to you, is the answer going to be good news? No. No. Not one of us would like the bubble over our head to be visible to everyone else, right? That's what poverty of spirit is. And he says you get the kingdom. It's even simpler than the four spiritual laws at one level. But, of course, it's not simple because... Is there ever going to be a time in our life on earth when that isn't an appropriate way to start the day? I don't think so. But starting there is incredible, what it does for you. Uh, so internal honesty is the first... If the church became much more internally honest, and therefore slowly externally, nobody would be making the charge of inauthenticity or hypocr hypocrisy. It would have died. And at the moment, they can make that charge, and they do very well, and they don't take us seriously because of it. The reason Jordan Peterson is, li is liked so much by the young is you can't watch him and not realize that he cares and that he's trying to be honest. And they'll forgive you everything for those two things. Uh, if they know you actually care about what happens to them and you're speaking the truth, they'll defend you. It's fascinating. I, I'm very politically incorrect, but I never ran into trouble, ever, in the university. And uh, I asked the students who I knew, and they said, oh, when you say outrageous things, it's the liberal students who defend you, not the Christians. They say he gave you lots of opportunity to, to, to say something. Why didn't you say something? You can't pretend to be something you aren't and teach students for a year without them knowing you're lying. It's better to start off with telling them who you are. And they can leave the class then if they want. So I always began my class by saying I'm intolerant. And then showing them that intolerance is necessary for a stable society. And they never forgot it. So that's where Jesus wants us to start, with a lot more honesty than we have at the moment. Uh, and if we do, other, other things will start to flow. I wasn't intending to do this, but it happened. So uh, it's not, this, I'd left a space. This is what it is. The next beatitude as well. They are in order. What's the second one? Those that mourn. Those that mourn, yeah. What did he say this time? I think this is what we've heard several times today and yesterday. It's repentance. It's Lewis's. Repentance is what coming to God is like. So if you're honest about yourself and God shows up in response to that honesty, it's actually going to be somewhat overpowering in that the outcome, the best outcome, is is repentance. And that's when comfort comes in. No, you don't get the comfort from telling the truth. You get the comfort from repentance. And even that has a sting in its tail. Because comfort Jesus style is not comfort North American style. My favorite picture of this is in the Bayer Tapestry, where it has Bishop Otto comforting the troops. And Bishop Otto has a staff with a chain and a spike ball on it. And he is driving the troops into battle. That's comfort Jesus star. When he comforts you, he's going to push you out of your comfort zone in order 
that you might learn what real comfort is. You will never learn what God can do until you are out of the range where you can be responsible yourself. So Americans have a problem here. You like to be in charge, and if you stay in America, you can have the illusion that you are. It's when you get out of those ranges that things happen that couldn't happen any other way, and you know who did it. Um, That's what he wants. Now, what happens next? It's good to get the second one right. There's only one in eight chance. It's getting the, 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 the odds are getting better for you. Meek. That's right, meek. In the Catholic Bible, those two are reversed. Uh, I think the one that's become dominant is the better order, and I think you'll see why in a moment. Because meekness flows from the first two. The best, uh, the most helpful comment on this that I found was in Barclay, who's a, quite liberal, but. He's brilliant on street Greek from the first century. So if you ever see any of... There's a lovely book called A New Testament Word Book. It's a little book by, by Barclay, just about words in the New Testament that have really interesting uh, stories behind them. And meek is one of them. The word meek is actually very appropriate to where we are now because it, it's, it's a, about horses. You are meek when you have been trained broken in, trained, and are ready for battle. A war horse that is meek is ready to work. That's an incredible picture, isn't it? I think the way I like to think of it is that waking up in the morning and realizing that despite all my many failures, I'm forgiven. And then saying, Lord, ride me into battle today. Does the war horse have any big plans for the day? No, just obey. It's a beautiful beatitude. And you inherit the earth. Well, not the material one, right? I don't think it was an accident Mother Teresa and Princess Diana died so close to one another. Which of the two women was the richer? If you don't say Mother Teresa, it's back to poverty of spirit and ask God to show you what your response says about you. Uh, Mother Teresa was rich beyond anything Diana could ever imagine. That's the riches he wants. Love, joy, peace, hope, all those things. Uh, it's a beautiful word and uh, uh, I get lovely responses from that um, my favorite one occurred in, Tex- in California a few years back now I, I was in Fresno and uh, speaking to about 50 physicians uh, in a modest uh, physicianly home um, some of you got the point uh, but just as I was about to start uh, a young woman came in at the end. She said, oh, good, I haven't missed anything. She's a, a surgeon and very, uh, what's the word I want, just bustling with energy. And she said, uh, uh, I remember you every day because when I get out of my car in the parking lot to go into the department of surgery, I say, Lord, ride me into battle today. <laughs> Not a reasonable thing for a woman in the department of surgery to do, I think. But that's what it's meant to be. Everyday life. Now, what does that do to you? What's the next one? Those of you who haven't got it on your phone by this stage, that's called cheating. <laughs> hmm? Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, yeah. What's, happen- what's happening now? Well, when you've got to this stage, life becomes more exciting because you see things happen and you realize, yeah, the gospel is as powerful as it ever was. Uh, lives are changed. Uh, It's still that way. And you want more. And this is straightforward. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are going to get it. Uh, That's lovely. Now, the next one is sadly one that's very needed in many churches, which is, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Uh, When I'm preaching, which I do a few times a year, uh, if I'm talking about this, and I usually do, uh, I've been told many times now that when you go to a church, if they they haven't heard you do the Sermon on the Mount, that's what you have to do the first time. And Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6, the second, then you can do what you like. And I know that's right now, because they were both gifts. What I'm talking to you now, I I didn't know it was going to come up this this evening, but it did, so there we are. It's amazing what what you see. The the point is it's the only 
beatitude that's repeated later. One is repeated at the end of the beatitudes, it's the same one, but this one is repeated later in the Sermon on the Mount. Where? Well, it's after the Lord's Prayer. And it's rather frightening. After the Lord's Prayer, and we never say it, we probably should occasionally, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. There is not a curse. That's simply a statement of moral reality. If you have not forgiven someone, how can you expect to be forgiven yourself? It's not possible. And there are, in every church, there are people who haven't spoken to one another for years. Uh, it's a problem we have to deal with. It. We all have the problem uh, because things happen that do upset us and then we've got to work our way through till we get to the point where in some way or other uh, real attempts at reconciliation are made. Not easy. has to be done. Uh, and if you're stuck, what do you do? You go back to poverty of spirit. You ask God to show you, what is my inability to relate to X or Y doing to me? And he will show you. And the answer, it's not good news. It doesn't matter how bad it was. It's made worse by you not being as Christ would have you and saying, okay, it happened. That doesn't mean that you pretend that there are no consequences. There are, but it's got to be dealt with. Our churches would be different if this was done. Now, that leads to the next one. Uh, your standards of What's the word I want? Living or changing. Blessed are the pure in heart. My favorite uh, aphorism for this is Kierkegaard's. Purity of heart is to will one thing. That's beautiful, isn't it? One line. And he's, he's nailed it in one line. And what is that? Thy will be done. Ultimately, the only prayer. I mean, all our prayers ultimately come down to thy will be done. And... Thy will be done is what purity of heart is. Um, and they will see God. Haven't got there yet. Um, minor glimpses, that's about all. But the, I have some sense of what the real thing must be like, overpowering. I love the fact that Thomas Aquinas, having written the greatest intellectual feat in 500 years, not quite written, he never finished it. Shortly before he died he had a meeting with Christ in the chapel. He was in a trance. And another priest, another monk was there and recorded what he heard, which was Christ saying to Thomas, well done, Thomas, what you wish. And Thomas said, only you, O Lord. And he never wrote another word after that. He never picked up his pen again. When asked why he'd stopped writing, he said, it's all straw. The greatest intellectual feat in 500 years was turned into straw by one sentence with Jesus. That's incredible. But it's not that you can find that phenomenon in other places too. He, he made good works in advance for us to do because he needs them. No, he has no needs. Because we need to do them. And he uses them for the good of other people. Thomas didn't get it all right, but my goodness, he made an incredible contribution. Uh, we're all dwarves standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, that leads to the next one. When you've reached that point, do you care about what other people say in the way that young women do now looking at Instagram? Do you care whether there's a thumb up or a thumb down? No. Their opinion is of no value whatsoever. There's only one opinion that matters, and if you're at peace with that one, the rest don't matter. And if they upset you, it's back to the beginning until you can get that straight. We are only concerned about one opinion in the whole cosmos, and that's our Lord. That, that should make you free. Anxiety really is an unnecessary state of affairs, unless it's the biochemical abnormality that we know more about now. But what Paul says in the last chapter of Philippians is true. Tell God about all your anxieties and then think about good things, knowing that he is going to do what he does. Now you work your way through that list and try and put something in each slot and it's not going to be a problem. I often had to tell 
mums that the problem they'd got was much bigger than they realised. I had a lot of Prada Villa children. I collected virtually all of them in the Ottawa area at one stage because I actually knew where it was. Uh, I, I got there in a very unusual way this, through obob mice who are congenitally obese mice and we discovered something in the lab and thought it. I knew there were, vaguely that there was a, a, a human disease somewhat like it so I went looking and found them. It, it didn't lead to anything except I ended up looking after all the Prada Villa children in Ottawa area. Uh, the only thing I ever did for them was to get them all together so they didn't realize they were mad because these children, when they come into the world, are very difficult to feed. So initially, they don't thrive because you can't get them to eat. And then they start to eat and mother is, heaves a great sigh of relief and then you have to tell her, actually, your problems are just beginning because these children have no appetite, no appetite control. So they, they can get to be 200-pound eight-year-olds and they kill themselves after they get to 18 because the Liberal government gives them a pension and you can no longer stop them overeating and they die of overeating in about 10 years. Uh, and there was nothing you could do to help them except say, you're not crazy, while, while their children have a, every piece of food in the house under lock and key. Uh, and you can control them when they're small, but not after that. But one woman I met some years later uh, in a Bible study that I was doing in Ottawa, and she said hello, and I asked how Robbie was, and she said, he's passed on. And uh, I said, I'm sorry, and she said, you know, you did the best thing for me. I said, well, I did nothing. There was nothing I could do. She said, you, you found out that I was a Christian in the first interview, and you said to me as I left, you know, I think you might find it useful to copy out the last chapter of Philippians and put it on your fridge. It might help you. And she said, that's the only thing that kept me going sometimes. Uh, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Not, it wasn't a gift. He learned how to do that. Uh, that's what it's about. Now, once you get to be the sort of person who has, has got to saying only God's opinion matters, now you can be a peacemaker, which is the next one. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Uh, because when things get really nasty, which in academic circles they do all the while, uh, there's nobody more petty uh, than an academic. Uh, you can tell. When you give them a paper, they look at the, re the references first to see if they're quoted, and if they aren't, they're out for the guy who didn't quote them. It, it's, that, it's that stupid, but that's what it's like. So every academic department has nasty snitches going on that is perhaps what you expect to find amongst seven-year-old girls, but not 50-year-old men. But that's what it is. And it can get so bad that somebody has to do something about it. That's when they'll come to you and say, can you, do, can you talk? Can you? Because both sides have to trust somebody. And somebody who only cares about the opinion of God is transparent. My version of, of uh, I have a, another aphorism, so to speak, for blessed are the pure in heart. Uh, Kierkegaard's is the lovely one uh, to will one thing. Mine is, blessed are the transparent, for they shall be removed from all committees. <laughs> uh, and that's true. If you want to get off a committee, that's the way to do it. Uh, go along, say nothing, listen until a bit of insider information comes along, which is what committee's about. It's always about being ahead of everybody else in some sense, sadly. And then you say, who should know that? How do we make sure they do? You won't get the minutes till after the next meeting. You never get to another meeting. It's wonderful. When I left the university, I was on one committee. Uh, I was the chairman, and it never met. Uh, it was, the, it was the, the committee that looked after... Oh, I've got a name block. When the kids go off to other places... What's... Ro ro external rotation. It has, a, it has a name, doesn't it? What is it? It's gone at the moment for some reason. Uh, but if they came along wanting to do a session in a, an accredited medical school, what could I do but sign it? I didn't need a committee for that. I'm not going to go and visit every medical school. But I could persuade them every now and again that if, since they weren't enjoying medicine that much, with a little help from me, I could get them to go around the world on a round-the-world ticket and take a year over it. All they needed was a landing point in Africa and a takeoff, and the same in India, same in Indonesia, and perhaps Australia or New Zealand to complete their holiday. But they went from mission hospital to mission hospital in each of those places. 
And when you're in third and fourth year and you don't know what you want to do and they're trying to make you choose your life position, that's stupid. Go and taste, see what you like doing. Wonderful experience. And of course, as a medical student, you find yourself doing cesarean sections and all sorts of things in mission hospitals because you're the best pair of hands that's available that can understand every instruction. Uh, if you've got kids going through medical school and not enjoying it, you can send them to us for a year. Any dean will give you a student eight months off to come and do our course at Augustine because they know students are burning out. And no dean is going to say no to a student who says, I've got a chance to go around the world for a year, uh, going from mission hospital to mental, mission hospital and seeing all the, the stuff that I will see that way. I say, go. We need to be different from everybody else. And this is one of the ways we can be. Now, when you've been useful in making peace, don't expect to be rewarded. You will be punished in various ways. They're trivial so far. But in Ontario now, you can be punished by losing your job. And that's going to increase. It'll come to you in America as well. That's going to, make, that's going to take courage. Uh, but Jesus says, the kingdom is yours. And he even repeats that one, of course. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you for my name's sake. What do you do next? Rejoice. It's not a feeling. It cannot be a feeling because you cannot command your feelings. So it gives you two reasons. Look at the company you've joined. It's pretty striking. And you have a reward in heaven. Two good reasons for rejoicing. Christian rejoicing is rational rejoicing. It's not dependent on external stimuli. It, it, it's rational to, to rejoice by thinking about who God is and what he's done. Not ear splitting grins, far from it very frequently, but that deep undercurrent of certainty that is joy in the best form. That's why Lewis said he was surprised by joy. Of course, they let him have it when his wife was joy, but that's okay. He was surprised twice. So that's how the Sermon on the Mount works. And then Jesus goes on to, to say something that our churches need so much. When those things are in place, now you can become salt and light. And what I want to talk about now is ways in which we can become salt and light. Uh, and I miss a chunk out here, but uh, the first thing that it seems to me we need to do in this age where doctors are going to be made into killers is to provide a place where that won't happen in some sense. To, to, we've got to think about protection. And the first thing I think you should think about is working against living wills. You're required to sign living wills in many places now. Uh, I think we should insist on substituting power of attorney. And the reason for this is very straightforward. Uh, you cannot predict exactly what your death will be like. Now, if you sign a living will and as you get to old people's homes and the like, it will have a clause about not wanting to go on life support. No, you don't want to sign that. You might have an allergic reaction to a drug and get laryngeal edema. Then you do want to go on life support. Uh, it's for a few hours and you're off again. But if you've said, I don't want to go, they can let you die. Nothing will happen. And they will. So a living will is going to be a means of killing yourself if you're not careful. What you want is to say, is for the church to provide people who are tough enough and understand the system well enough. The ideal group, in my view, would be a retired doctor, a retired lawyer, and someone like my wife who won't take no for an answer if she doesn't think it's an appropriate answer. That would, they, and they would go into ICU a few times. And would ICU welcome them? Oh, yes. Because how much work in ICU is done basically to protect the hospital in you from lawyers? A lot. If there's a valid power of attorney, you can't be sued. So it would make life a lot better. And what would we be wanting to do out of that? Don't you want someone to appear by your bedside at the end of your life and say to the people who currently have control of you, get these tubes out. This person is at peace with his or her God and would like to die, ideally at home if we can do that, if not at least a room where all friends and relatives can freely visit and those who need to. Dying should become a moment for preaching the gospel. 
That's because that's what it's meant to be. Uh, it's very hard to do that in the ICU. How many of you have read Wendell Berry's lovely story in uh, Fidelity? Isn't that a beautiful story? Every, every doctor should read it. Uh, the, the whole no there's a whole novel called Fidelity, but I know you don't read much. Just read the chapter, which is labeled Fidelity. Uh, this is a spoiler a little bit, but knowing how little you read, it's probably not. Uh, Wendell Berry uh, introduces you to the guy who dies in Fidelity in the first book in the series. He's there in, in uh, Watch With Me. He's uh, the boy who can't do his poetry for Miss Minnie, and it's hil hilarious. Uh, yeah. Somebody who's got a sudden accent could read it to church and they would find it very funny. But he never, he never grew up to be a responsible adult. Uh, he didn't settle down to be a proper adult. He was always off hint hunting or just generally a bit of a layabout, but very funny, and the whole village got on with him. Burley, he was called. He used to help at peak times in the farming cycle, so planting tobacco and harvesting tobacco, he'd be there for that. But at the time of this story, he, he is getting old, so after lunch, he's asleep under a tree uh, rather than helping with the planting and the the harvesting and of course the wisdom of the old is always overwhelmed by the go get it of the young and the young say there's something wrong with Burley we need to take him to uh, the hospital and the old people say leave him alone he's just getting old but of course he gets taken to the hospital in due course and that syndrome that you've all seen of someone walking into the hospital having a few tests and landing up in ICU happens to Burley uh, and the country people come to visit him. And of course, the one phrase you... I used to use this for students in a medical humanities program. And the one phrase that you had to unpack is... Bert, uh, Wendell Berry writes, they came where their offerings could not be accepted. What he's saying is that white-coated intensivist is being asked to be a priest, to take the offerings of friendship and... Comfort the country people by saying, I will make this clear to him as soon as it's possible. At least give them some sense that he understood what they were trying to do. But, of course, he, he couldn't. So they went home desperately disappointed that this was the way Burley was going to die. Uh, that night, his son, he'd sired a son in the village without marrying, his son found out in due course. Uh, and... He puts his elbow in his wife's ribs and wakes her up and says, he shouldn't be in that hospital. I'm going to go and get him. Now, the country people, they couldn't deal with the niceties of taking discharge from ICU. Uh, it's very funny. He drives into town in his old pickup and then goes up through casualty where emerge where chaos is in place so nobody notices, finds a place where he can see the door of the ICU. And eventually there's a moment when his dad's left all alone, everybody's at the other end. He pops in with a trolley, lifts him off, uh, out into the parking lot and into the pickup, uh, uh, gone. <laughs> now he knows he can't take him home because the police will be there in the morning. So he's already told his wife, if the police turn up, say, I'm in Minnesota. Um, but uh, his wife gets the call from the, the hospital that... How do you say it? Your father-in-law has been abducted from the hospital. <laughs> and we're, the police will be coming to ask you questions. So she goes immediately to the village attorney who says, you'd better all be in my office when the police arrive. And so the police arrive and the village locks solid and the police depart with, in inverted commas, an unsolved crime. And all I have to say to the medical students when we finish the story is about 35 pages. Where does your sympathy lie? With the doctors or with the people in the village? And of course, it's the people in the village. And they spend about an hour talking in about, am I going to end up like that? That's the commonest question I used to get from students when they started clinical medicine. They'd come back and say, am I going to be like them? Now, hopefully, you model a different way. And they say, am I going to be like them in a hopeful way? But that's not the usual response. So you can see what I'm saying here, that around Burley, there was a, a community that, that helped him. Our churches need to be like that. We're good. I, I, I go to a country church now, and what really impresses me 
It's the way they care for one another. It's very old-fashioned. Nobody gets sick in that church without everybody knowing and prayed for and people visit them. And, you know, that, that's a wonderful thing, and I appreciate it deeply. Uh, you, can, you can forgive a lot when that kind of community is in place. And the moment you start teaching them, they want more. But power of attorney would be number one. Parish nurse would be number two. Uh, especially in these days of complex treatment schedules. Uh, a retired nurse can easily become a parish nurse. Just know who's sick and know what medicines they're on. See that they're taking them properly. Take their blood pressure. Just talk to them. Uh, most importantly, uh, know exactly what's likely to happen next which is the parish nurse and the patient advocates could be in the same program, but as well as the care for the patient in the context of your church, we need patient advocacy programs too. I don't think anyone over the age of 60 should go to interact with the medical system alone. I think they, they need someone with them who goes in for the interview with them, not sits outside. You're not just going to hold their hands. Be there in the interview. You as a doctor would actually appreciate that because you can ask the patient the questions you need to ask very quickly. And then you can say to the person who actually understands the language, you know, we've got to think about this, 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 this and they understand. And that, then you, as the patient advocate, have as many cups of coffee or meals that you need and you don't make any decisions unless they have to be made at that moment. You go away and work out which of the modern options are the ones that I should take. Now, if you start offering patient advocacies to your church, you'll get a rise in membership from those who hear about this program and come to the church for that reason. And you could take this a lot further. Uh, it appalls me that we're so somnolent about looking around. How many young people in your church are out of work at any given time? Now, if you live in a place like Canada, in winter, you shouldn't have any unemployed young people in the church. They should be ferrying old people to do their shopping and the like. When, when the parking lot is icy, do you think old people would appreciate being taken to the door and dropped off and saying, call me when you need to be picked up? How many cars are in your church, so to speak, that are no longer used? to any significant extent. And what amount of capital does that represent? Would it be possible to run an intra-church service that would use that capital more effectively? I think the answer's got to be yes. Because it's not just ferrying to and from uh, shopping or whatever. There's lots of other things. That once you start thinking about it, we, we ought to be doing something about those that, for whatever reason, didn't get the education they should have done and helping them along the line. Churches that do this are going to be doing what Jesus would have done. He went and ate with those that needed to talk to him one-on-one -on -one and he changed their lives. Uh, we could do a lot more. We're, we're just too busy. In your, your system of, uh, what's the word I want, uh, of pensions, particularly what you've done to the black community by saying that a, a black girl who gets pregnant doesn't get money from the state if her, the man who sired the child lives with her. So you actually put an economic barrier in the way of marriage. Johnson did that. Uh, and it, it, it's got to have a large causal uh, weight in the fact that black boys in America don't know who their father is. Uh, we in the church can be more active on these issues. This is not just medicine. Now, so that's... John, are we nearing the conclusion? Yeah, uh, that's what I'm uh, realizing that. And I, I want to finish with a reference to the Clapham sect as a, as a challenge to us. Whether, can't we do something similar? In the 18th century, when... Uh, Whitfield and Wesley started to preach. London was a disastrous place. Those of you who've watched the BBC Pride and Prejudice 
that picture of Darcy searching in the back streets of London, you got some sense. They, they did it quite well. But it was a time when advertising was drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two, clean straw for three. Life was so bad in the early Industrial Re Revolution time that people wanted to get out of it, and they got out of it by shutting their minds down with gin. And London was a gin-soaked city. And then Wesley and Whitfield started to preach. And in very short order, it changed. If you want to talk about development, I think the story of Whitfield cannot be beaten. And you rarely see it mentioned in people who go to mission conferences about development. I just wrote a paper about this, by the way, if you want to copy, Sally can send you one. Um, Whitfield had a wonderful voice. He was a good friend of Ben Franklin later on, and Franklin measured his voice as clearly audible at a quarter of a mile. That's quite some voice. Um, anyway, uh, he was an Anglican priest, and he realized there was the sort of Anglican church community that the Bennets went to, the upper classes, and then there were the rest who never went to church. And he was the first Anglican priest in England to preach out of doors. The bishop at the time, who was a very good theologian, uh, still quoted, would forbade him to do it, but he, he disobeyed the bishop. And there's an account in the Bristol newspapers at the time. He preached in the Forest of Dean, which sounds beautiful, but it wasn't. It was open cast mining. And the miners were the most oppressed and degraded people around. They lived in hovels. Uh, and dug up open cast coal. And the, the, the newspaper report talks of white lines appearing down the faces of the miners as they listen to Whitfield preach. Repentance. Uh, six weeks later, before he came back to America, those miners, where he was doing mission work, uh, those miners asked him to have a meal with them. And after the meal, they asked him to lay the foundation stone of their own school. Six weeks from total degradation to, being, to thinking about schooling your children. That's development. And of course, in Britain, uh, if you go there now, in every village in rural Britain, you find a little Baptist church, and a, which is Whitfield, and a little Methodist church, which is Wesley, uh, mainly turned into weekend homes for the wealthy. But Fra France had a bloody revolution. England had Wh Wesley and Whitfield. The conditions were the same in both places. Those are the two options. We were blessed for no very good reason. But the real thing that amazes me about the 18th century revival, so different from the ones of the 20th century, was what? What happened? By their fruits you shall know them. The abolition of slavery straight out of Whitfield's preaching. The reform of the prisons, Elizabeth Fry. The end of child labor, Shaftesbury. Uh, all out of the Clapham sect. The repeal of the Corn Laws, which dramatically changed the whole economic basis of England to give uh, the lowest, almost serf-like class a means to expand, to grow. All that came out of the 18th century revival. I don't think you can name anything that came out of 20th century evangelical revivals like that. I was in Moscow a few years after the Billy Graham crusade went there, and I asked, what effect did it have? And they said, we actually asked that question, and we couldn't find anyone in the evangelical churches in Moscow at that time who were converted to the Billy Graham crusade. And yet, when it came to the uh, the altar call, people ran to the front. They thought they were going to get a gift of some sort. Uh, but it didn't work. There is a revival going on in Russia now, in the Orthodox Church. We should be praying for it. It's interesting. But what I'm saying is, could your ch church be more active? That reading group we talked about this morning will help you to, to get some fuel for the argument. But what I've been talking about, it could change the world. I mean, if we do manage to divide the medical system 
into two sectors on the basis of the, the moral commitments of Hippocrates, the moral nature of medicine, the sanctity of life and rights of conscience, then these two will come together. We would run our medical system on covenantal ethics. They will run them on contractual ethics. And you can see it. You're, you work now in situations that are pushing contractual behavior in every direction. That's not what medicine was about. Medicine is covenantal, where the doctor at best says to the patient, I will walk to you, with you to the gates of death. I will be with you all the way. In return, you will acknowledge me by suing only for incompetence. How much, su how much of the, the litigation worries that you have and the insurance you pay are due not to incompetence, but to outcome, and your system, which is so twisted, can allow the outcome to determine the decision, not whether there was incompetence involved. New Zealand went to sleep for one day, and the, the, the lawyers must have had a conference or something, because they passed a bill in New Zealand making it uh, a country where you can only sue doctors for incompetence. A surgeon's insurance is 500 bucks a year. They set up insurance systems for people who get bad outcomes in medicine because some bad outcomes are a necessary part of med modern medicine, aren't they? If you're an oncologist and you never have anybody die from the drug, what will your overall figures be like? They'll be nowhere near what they should be. That is the price you pay. We're not good enough, but we, we know in very scientific terms, we try and take the optimum. Uh, so bad outcomes are part of the deal. But it's not the doctor's fault, so the doctor shouldn't be paying. Now, in one area, you do it better than Canada. At least when some when child gets a reaction to, say, some of the few vaccines that do this, they, what, one in 100,000 people get a reaction of some sort, and uh, one in a bit more than that to get a really serious one. But the nation picks up the whole bill. In Canada, they don't pick up the whole bill. They do pick up most of it. But you rightly pick up the whole lot because that was an act of citizenship on the part of the, the parents to take a risk for their child, for the, the common good. Uh, different worlds. But our medicine should go back to that kind of thing, and it would be much cheaper. We would get all the severe chronic diseases, but that doesn't matter. We would be much cheaper to run because we would also have higher degrees of trust. So go away from Deer Valley and ask, can I help my church to model a way of dealing with the sick people in the congregation uh, in a better way? You might end up with one of your young doctors saying, I'll run a cash-only uh, program with the church as my base. And that would be good. Any questions? Or do you just want to go and do something else? Did you mention earlier this week that there was actually some talk going on about that division? Oh, yes. Can you... Can you yeah, I can say a bit. Uh, the first meeting took place in Duke about uh, three weeks ago, something like that. Um, <laughs> for, okay. Um, Far Curlin... Uh, is an evangelical physician who has a personal chair and program at Duke in theology and medicine with about 11 people in the program. Uh, he's funded. Uh, we've been friends since he was a resident. Uh, we had a long talk when he was beginning thinking about what he would do and he wanted, he said, what would you choose uh, as an area where I could make a permanent impact for faith? And I said, well, the place to do it is ethics, because they're changing it from medical ethics to bioethics, and the intent is to drive Christians out. They want secular ethics. You know, people like Harris, uh, and who think that people are commodities. Uh, you know, when they're past their sell-by date, you kill them and take their organs, uh, and he thinks that's ethical. But in order to, to get into that environment and, and for them not to be able to touch you, you have to write very solid and very boring papers that get published in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
on making the case about ethics. And he's done that. And the result is a chair at Duke. And we've been talking about, I've been talking for 20 years about the need to be preparing for this. Uh, but nobody would listen. He did. And he said, he invited me to this conference with several other people. We all knew one another when we got there, except one or two. Um, we had a, a lovely two-day thing at Duke. Uh, the, the American ADL, what is it? ADF, American Defense Forum or whatever. Anyway, big uh, liberty. Alliance for, for uh, yeah, that's right, that's the one. What's it called? Alliance? Alliance that's right. They want to fund the program. Uh, they offered us room in their uh, Washington set up for free. Um, Far said, thank you, but we probably need to be invisible as long as possible. We'd like to use it as long as, but no name there yet. So uh, the question now we have to work on, and there are people willing to fund it and help it, is what would it need to look like at an administrative level? And can we find a place where we could test it out and see that it works? We've done it at the, there's already evidence at the level of private practice and the like that you can operate on a more Christian basis and it be economically successful. I mean, there's a, a CMDA member, his name I've forgotten again, of course, who lives in New Jersey who's done this. And she's politically astute. They could initially afford her, she and her husband to give one day a week to the care of the poor. But she was smart in looking at how effective they were. So she actually got into politics in order to make some contacts. And she eventually got to run against Chris Christie. She knew she wouldn't win, but she would talk to him. And she said, look, this is what we do at the moment. If you will pick up uh, necessary legal costs under the law, which you will never have to pay out on it, the state doesn't have to have the money there. They just say they'll pick them up. We can do twice as much work. And we are well over twice as efficient as the money that's spent in your social services department. Christie thought that was good, and they're doing it. Because this commodity of trust, again, is going to be incredibly valuable. We need to market it. Um, so that, when the next step comes along, I think there will be something coming out through CMDA and CMDS. CMDS will have to follow because we have a socialized system already uh, that needs, is out of control. Yeah. What? It, well, it, it hasn't. The yeah, that, that's the name. That, it, that's still an ad hoc name at the moment, but it'll probably stay. You think? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, they've got some very well organised people like Donna Harrison from Aplog. So, uh, I think it will fly. I, I hope and pray that it will fly. Put it on your prayer list, uh, and keep watching. But I don't see how else we survive. Any other questions? Well, it's been good to be with you, and thank you for your patience with me. Um.